Well, I'm B.B. Price. I'm the editor of New Mexico Mercury. In the wake of the behavioral health care scandal in New Mexico, I'm here today with former state senator and, and good friend Dee Dee Feldman uh, to talk about the power of lobbyists in, in the state legislature and the role they play throughout our electoral system. Uh, Dee Dee has written a book expected to be out later this year from UNM Press on New Mexico lobbying and politics called Inside the New Mexico Senate, Boots, Suits, and Citizens. She's currently working on an analysis of lobbying for Common Cause New Mexico. It's great to have you here with us, Dee Dee. Thank you so much for coming to the New Mexico Mercury Library. Well, thanks for having me. And I really love being here in, in your house in my former district in the North Valley. <laughs> That's right. As we've talked about before, some 700 lobbyists work the halls of the state legislature. Some of them support uh, policies and ideas that I would consider monstrous, and some of them support things that I whole, wholeheartedly uphold. Uh, could you tell us and explain a little bit the role of lobbyists in an unpaid legislature like our own? Well, lobbyists are a really important part of our state government and any government, and um, no more so than in a citizen legislature where uh, there is no staff, uh, there is no salary, and so lobbyists often are there to fill in those gaps. Wow. Um, now, there are so many different types of lobbyists. Uh, there's citizen lobbyists, like you or I, or anyone who goes up there and is passionate about an issue. There are professional lobbyists, and um, I would say there's a core of probably around, you know, 40 to 60 of those. Some of them have more than one client. Some of them have as many as 40 clients. Wow. Um, and then there are also sort of technical lobbyists, uh, folks that are real experts in their field by virtue of their former jobs or their current jobs. Uh, there are presidents of universities that come up and act as lobbyists. There are former secretaries of taxation and revenue who come and testify about tax policy. There are water experts who uh, testify about water. So there's sort of technicians, there's citizens, and then there's the professionals. The suits that I write about in my book are really the professional lobbyists. Um, that often have more than one client. And uh, sometimes um, the technicians who come from out of state because they are uh, professional uh, prescription drug lobbyists wow. or represent big tobacco uh, or some other, the NRA or some of the other big national interests. So in our conversation uh, a while back, we talked a little bit about how many key guys there are. Uh, key lobbyists. Uh, and we also talked about lobbying as being sort of part of the fiber of, of the legislative process. Um, could you ramify that a little bit? Barrett, a lot of this goes back to the fact that we're a citizen legislator and we, do, we don't have um, salaries, uh, we have per diems, uh, and we don't have full-time staff, although there is legislative staff during the session. So the lobbyists become, they fill that gap. Uh, they, uh, they are sometimes the experts, uh, much more so than legislators themselves, who just may be off the boat uh, and can't be an expert on every single issue that comes before them. So they rely uh, on lobbyists for their expertise uh, because they don't have all of the staff to research the issues. And they also rely on lobbyists uh, because they only get about $150 a day per diem. And they need to eat, and they need to drink, and they need to stay someplace. And so, you know, the lobbyists are there in Santa Fe. They're very generous. They're there to take you out to eat. Uh, they're there to take you home if you've had too much to drink. Uh, and um, they are... Uh, like family to most of the legislators. And in fact, they are family to many of the legislators. Um, some are daughters, some are brothers, some are 
uh, some are husbands and wives, and um, the lobbyists themselves also sometimes operate in family units. Um, their son will be um, uh, lobbying with them after a number of years, or their, their brother and uh, brother and sister lobbying teams, husband and wife lobbying teams. These are all you know, some of the best friends of legislators, because when you become a legislator, you kind of, you know, you spend a lot of time with the in-group, with the people that are in the legislature, uh, with the lobbyists, with the staff. Um, and, um, you know, you become very friendly. And, um, you know, uh, lobbyists are there to sharpen your pencil. Uh, they're there to get you a drink when you're thirsty. Uh, they're there to take your uh, dry cleaning to the dry cleaners. And, um, you know, it's all very uh, helpful to, uh, to legislators who are exhausted for most of the time. So out of those 700 lobbyists, how many are really, really influential? Well, it all depends. You know, it all depends upon um, the session. But I would say there are probably around 60 that are really well known to legislators. They're very influential. They represent maybe four or five different clients who are in a position to donate to a legislator's campaign. Um, and mm. Uh, the legislators come to depend upon them, uh, not only for campaign contributions, uh, but also, as I said earlier, to support a kind of lifestyle that you could not support on, um, you know, $150 a day yeah. or, you know, or on just a normal salary. Legislators um, get to go to fancy conferences in um, Chicago, San Francisco, New Orleans. These are just some of the ones that I went to. And the lobbyists are always there. And the lobbyists are always there to sponsor a um, New Mexico dinner. Um, and during the session, the lobbyists uh, sponsor the, some of the traditional uh, events that occur every session, the 100 bill party, uh, they buy lunches for committees, they buy dinners for committees, uh, some of them very, very extravagant. Um, and legislators come to, um, come to feel that they're making so many sacrifices by being a legislature in term, especially opportunity cost, yeah. that they are turning down jobs or they can't really go into a full-time job because they're legislators, part-time. So, um, you know, so I think there's kind of a feeling, and I, and I include myself here, I am not without sin in this area, um, come to depend upon and really like uh, many of the lobbyists, I mean, they're experts in policy. They're your peers in very many ways. So these deeply influential lobbyists, uh, how did they get so close to legislators? Is it because they used to be uh, some themselves? Yeah. One of the reasons why it's such a family atmosphere and such a... Um, a feeling of collegiality, I would say, is because many of the lobbyists are former legislators themselves. We now have 13 former senators who are currently lobbying and about um, 11 former representatives, including the Speaker of the House. Um, in, the, in the Senate, we have a former uh, majority leader. Uh, we have some uh, very well-respected former legislators who know where the bodies are buried yeah. and they know the legislative history of issues and that's very helpful to legislators who um, you know who don't have the time to do that research themselves uh, it can be very helpful uh, in many different ways when you're when you have a lobbyist on your side and when you have a lobbyist who is not on your side so I know you're working with Common Cause on a report about lobbying. Uh, could you explain a little bit about that project to us? Common Cause has been working on some of these good government issues for years, dating back to Elizabeth Drew. Right. And um, 
They have done a number of reports over the years, which they call the Connect the Dots report, where uh, they look at campaign contributions and try to connect the dots to outcomes, try to find out whether um, the campaign contributions are actually getting results uh, for those who give them, which are uh, special interests, some of whom we agree with, some of whom we don't agree with. And um, they've done one in terms of health care. I think that was the last one they did. Uh, they did one on oil and gas. Uh, they did one on tobacco a while back. Um, and uh, this is one in those series, although it's a little bit different, because uh, that was mainly about uh, lobbyist employers and the special interests who employ the lobbyists. Um, this is going to be about the lobbyists and their expenditures as well as the special interests. They are hired guns. Um, and they are, um, but they're a certain kind of hired gun. And, um, you know, it really does go beyond roll call votes. It goes um, into um, the influence that lobbyists might have on a committee. Um, the friendship that a lobbyist might have with the chairman of committees. And those are not things that you can, uh, you can trace in votes uh, because uh, sometimes it's when an issue doesn't get heard or when it, uh, a small amendment is attached to a bill in the dead of night uh, when no public member is there at the committee only the lobbyists and the legislators. So that's what this report is about. So who are the major lobbyists and who do they represent? And more importantly, who are the really big spenders? <laughs> well, the research for the report that we're working on right now um, is unsurprising in some ways because um, the really important lobbyists, the really big spenders in Santa Fe during this past session were the ones that represented the biggest interests, the biggest contributors to campaigns. And these were lobbyists representing the oil and gas industry, which trades off every year with being the biggest contributor to New Mexico campaigns with the Trial Lawyers Association. And the trial lawyers mostly give to Democrats, and oil and gas mostly gives to Republicans. So there's there's a little dance they do there. Um, but uh, the lobbyists, um, the lobbyists are there. Um, there are about 34 that represent uh, 24 oil and gas companies. Wow. But there are only two permanent lobbyists that uh, represent the trial lawyers. Um, but they bring in uh, sort of grassroots lawyers from around the state to help them in lobbying their issues, uh, which are about liability and, and um, immunity from suit. Um, so they are very well respected. Um, they're not from out of state. You know, you, you get lobbyists, some lobbyists are, fly in from out of state when there's a big issue uh, that threatens their interests. Uh, when there's a, a, a bill like one I would su uh, support or sponsor that would uh, require bulk purchasing of pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. That would generate a lot of business for Santa Fe uh, restaurants and for um, hotels because all of the pharmaceutical lobbyists would fly in <laughs> to uh, testify before committees so that uh, they, they didn't have to... Uh, Pay, they didn't have to um, get lower prices for their drugs that were bought by Medicaid and other and other programs, but um, you know there are core probably of about you know forty to sixty lobbyists, professional lobbyists, and they um, they sometimes represent um, uh, you know ten clients a piece. Um, and some of them may be oil and gas, they may have a real estate client, they may have a university, they may have um, a payday lender. Uh, uh, some clients, uh, some lobbyists just represent, um, represent uh, 
clients from a certain area of the state, or they might represent all local governments from northern New Mexico, or they might uh, represent tribal interests. Um, there are a lot of uh, lobbyists that um, are very close to individual legislators, or let's say, you know, Intel. Intel um, is a big interest. It's a, a, a multinational corporation, but it's also naturally very involved with Rio Rancho mm. and the legislators from Rio Rancho. So the lobbyists from, uh, from Intel would naturally have a lot of clout with the Rio Rancho uh, legislators because it's jobs in mm. that district. And so there are things like, and then the mining interests would naturally, the, those lobbyists would naturally have a lot of clout with the people from grants, or the oil and gas would naturally have a lot of clout with the people from Farmington, or the legislator from Hobbs. So, you know, there's some regional patterns mm. there. Um, and um, they become easy to dis discern. Lobbyists have to, um, have to watch out, though, uh, with their clients, because they can't have conflicting clients that have Ooh, conflicting dear. interests. This is a problem. In some ways, um, you know, lobbyists, um, uh, they're, they're not all united. I mean, we talk, we're talking here about lobbyists as a force, as a big, it's like an invading army or something. No, these are people from our communities, and they do not speak with all, all with one voice, even though they might represent... Uh, the banking industry, for example, the credit industry, credit uh, unions have a different interest than the banks, than the mortgage bankers. Mm -hmm. And this is really true in the healthcare industry, too. So, um, you know, one of the things that we proposed in the past, and it was turned down, is that um, to make it easier for legislators and the public to identify who these lobbyists are, why not have them wear a name bag, a name badge with their clients listed on them? Wow, the lobbyists resisted this bitterly. Oh, wow. um, they did not want to uh, want to reveal all their their clients, or or maybe they thought it was too much like a NASCAR kind <laughs> of a, kind of operation there, and I can sympathize with that. But they are representing people and they don't just speak for themselves so i always felt that you know we had a right to know who they were talking for or you know when, when they're talking for one client as opposed to another client they usually said that yeah. in committees but you know you know you were never quite sure because when a, a lobbyist came your way you were thinking oh man i can't agree with him on um on this this issue, um, and I am going to vote against that against him on this issue because that's what my district feels. I know that because I've polled them. Uh, but then you had some little nagging thought back there. Oh, but wait a minute! He's the lobbyist for the railroad and for the primary care clinics. Maybe my contributions from them will be affected next time because he is the conduit for those campaign contributions. Oh dear. Oh dear. So this is something I don't think most people realize, that lobbyists are indeed the conduit for campaign contributions. I, uh, as a matter of fact, it's, it's news to me, really. Uh, could you explain how that actually works? And uh, do they actually write the checks? Do their companies that they represent? I mean, how does that money get moved around? So in addition to uh, contributing to campaigns themselves, and lobbyists do that, um, they also will give money on behalf of their clients. And they will report it as such. Sometimes they'll bring their clients and introduce them to legislators because, after all, they want their client to have access to that legislator. But um, this is, this is um, kind of the nexus because lobbyists are often advising their clients on who to give money to, 
strategically, you know, the client may be in the dark as to who's powerful in the New Mexico legislature. And they would like to give money to all the people they agree with. That's a natural human tendency. But the lobbyists might say, oh, no, no, you don't want to do that. That's not the smart thing to do. The Democrats are in control of the New Mexico legislature, so you need to give to the Democrats, not just the Republicans. And you need to give to committee chairs, because that's often where you can kill a piece of legislation that wants to change your operation. So these these machinations and movidas and movements of money and influence and power, uh, they operate pretty much invisibly most of the time. Every now and again, however, there are some hysterically funny moments and some outrageous moments. And I'm sure you've seen your share of those. Could you share some with us? Well, you know, the stories about New Mexico lobbyists in Santa Fe are kind of folklore, and they're not uh, horror stories by any means, Um, and they're part of New Mexico history. The most famous one probably was, um, occurred in the 1960s, and that was a a comment made by the legendary lobbyist Poncho Padilla, who happened to be one of my uh, constituents later on when he was an elder gentleman. And Poncho at one time was the uh, head lobbyist for uh, the liquor industry in New Mexico, uh, retail liquor dealers. And you remember how long it took us to close uh, drive-up windows here in New Mexico and how powerful the liquor industry was. And Poncho Padilla one time was successful in killing a bill that Fabian Chavez, who was the majority leader of the Senate in the mid-60s, had uh, to kind of control prices for ordinary bar goers. And um, Pancho came up to him uh, at the 100 bill party. Again, another piece of the sort of fabric of the New Mexico legislature was going on in the 1960s. And he said to Fabian, too bad, Fabian, I own the New Mexico legislature. <laughs> And, you know, everybody heard him and thought, oh, that's outrageous. How could a lobbyist say that they own the New Mexico legislature? So subsequently, he was banned from the floor of both the Senate and the House. But he continued as, his, uh, as a lobbyist for the liquor industry, and he was kind of a fixture in, in the uh, gallery for many, many years. One of my favorite lobbyists um, is John Lee Thompson, who is from Bernalillo County and a former legislator, former House member. And he is the lobbyist for um, the funeral directors. And uh, one time we were debating a bill, I think it was in the Rules Committee, and uh, it was about... um, you know, making sure that people who were deceased were removed from the rolls so that there could be no voter fraud. And, and uh, you know, the t- time came for public comment uh, on this piece of legislation, and John Lee got up and said, well, now those are my guys that you're talking about. These are, these are people that are recently deceased. We don't want them to be deprived of their rights. Uh, my, my morticians would be greatly appalled by this. And so, you know, everybody thought of the old joke about how uh, people uh, in, uh, I think it was Rio Arriba County, right. were voting out of the graveyard, and, and then the whole room erupted in uh, in laughter That's so great. that was funny and then another another um, thing that happened more recently was um, we had a legislator uh, we had a legislator resign while in office in order to become a lobbyist it wow. was uh, Senator Kent Craven oh. Cravens from New Mexico from from Albuquerque and um, he resigned and became the head lobbyist for the New Mexico Oil and Gas Association. And about a month after he had stepped down, he appeared uh, representing the Oil and Gas Association before the Rules Committee, uh, which he had been a member of. And I was a member of that committee as well. And the chairman said at that time, uh, oh, 
I see Senator Cravens out there in the office. Senator, how are you? Uh, your seat is still warm. Would you like to come up and vote? And she was joking, but I think it kind of brings into focus um, the kind of camaraderie uh, that exists between uh, legislators who become lobbyists and their former colleagues. What happens, do you think, when lobbyists are in conflict with one another and when they conflict? I know that, say, the trial lawyers opposed uh, legislation uh, desired by a wonderful um, enterprise called Virgin Galactic. Um, could you explain something of those doing? Could, because I think they're very instructive. You know, it puts legislators in a real jam when uh, there are lobbyists on both sides of an issue that they really trust and respect. And uh, this was, I think, the case uh, in the recent um, issue of immunity for Virgin Galactic in uh, sending folks up into sp space at the newly established spaceport. So, you know, this had been an issue for a number of years. It was resolved this year. Um, and the trial lawyers had been very adamant uh, that the immunity provision that was initially um, given to Virgin Galactic to attract them to establish this $200 million spaceport in southern New Mexico, um, that, that that immunity would go no further because immunity is not something that trial lawyers want. Uh, they don't feel that, um, you know, big corporations um, or doctors should be immune uh, from suit in the case of malpractice or in the case of um, shoddy manufacturer of products. It's not in the consumer interest. Um, and also, you know, there is an opportunity for individuals to, to take that case to a jury. So they were very adamantly opposed to expanding the immunity to the suppliers um, which is what Virgin Galactic wanted to do in the past two or three years, uh, not just to the operator of the spaceport, but to the people that made the spacecraft and the people that were on the ground and so on. Um, and the trial lawyers, you know, the trial lawyers are one of the big contributors to, um, to Democrats and to the legislature, and they're very strategic contributors. Uh, they are particularly interested in the Senate Judiciary Committee, the House Judiciary Committee, and also the House Business and Industry Committee. And for two years, they were able to block any additional immunity from passing in those committees. And we looked at the uh, contributions that the trial lawyers had given to members of those two committees and found that they were, um, uh, they were, huge, and that uh, the Virgin Galactic gave very little. Until the past couple of years, when Virgin Galactic then got into the game, hired a team of lobbyists that could compete uh, with the trial lawyers, and those, uh, those lobbyists were uh, very well respected. They included Republicans and Democrats, um, experienced lobbyists like Tom Horan, the former um, the former Speaker of the House, Raymond Sanchez, and uh, the f a former Republican National Committeeman, uh, Mickey Barnett. And so um, they then began ramping up their contributions, uh, their uh, contacts uh, with members of those two committees as well. And um, as it turned out, their uh, efforts began to have an effect. And uh, just this session, there was a, a compromise reached between the lobbyists for Virgin Galactic and the trial lawyers. The, le the Democratic leadership told them, you've got to get together and solve this problem. Um, and they did. So to me, this story shows um, that the leadership uh, the leadership can trump the power of lobbyists if they want to. Um, they can... Um, you know, rein in a powerful lobby if they want to. Um, and But of course, the lobbyists 
uh, have to be skillful and have the trust of the legislators to be able to strike a deal that uh, will be acceptable to both the leadership and the entire body. And this was. Uh, this, uh, this passed unanimously in both houses. Wow. Um, and uh, but it, but this was after three years. Yeah. It took three years, two of which were pretty intense battles uh, between Virgin Galactic lobbyists and trial lawyers lobbyists, which the trial lawyers won every, in every encounter. Um, but then finally, um, after a new a new lobbyist team and some some uh, contributions and some effort from um, Richard Branson who is rather a flashy, um, flashy guy himself, um, I think they came together knowing that we just can't abandon the $209 million that we've sunk into this facility for better or worse. When I speak with young people about the importance of voting, um, I do so in, in my classes at the university. They all say, oh, well, you know, my vote doesn't matter. Well, then we argued a little bit about that. And then I try to say, but that's not all you do as a citizen. You also lobby. And they say, well, yes, that's true. We can and we do. But we don't stand a chance against the pros. We don't stand a chance against all that money. All we have is just an honorable opinion or an honorable point of view. So it seems to me that that uh, is ingrained and <clears throat> deeply embedded as lobbyists are in the process, that uh, it's not exactly the way things should operate. And I'm wondering if there are ways to remedy the most, um, uh, the most egregious abuses. Well, lobbying in and of itself, there's nothing wrong with it. It's guaranteed by the Constitution. It's freedom of speech. It's freedom of assembly. What does give your students and others a sense of powerlessness, though, is the unprecedented access that the money lobbyists purvey and the access that they have um, brings to any issue. And uh, as that has gone on, public confidence in legislators and legislatures now hovers between like 20 and 30 percent. It used to be in the time of Dwight Eisenhower, uh, 80 percent, and then uh, it declined to around 60 percent with Johnson. But um, we can uh, reform the system to take out um, the edge that lobbyists have now. And we already have some laws uh, that restrict lobbying in New Mexico, and we've, um, we've passed several of them in the past few years. We have a law that does restrict lobbyists from making, or anyone, from making contributions to legislators during the legislative session. Mm. That's very, very important. And we have a lot of uh, transparency laws that require lobbyists to register, uh, to say who they are, um, and also to report if they do spend money uh, during the legislative session or if they do make contributions during the year. Now, that is uh, only as good as its enforcement. And right now, the Secretary of State um, doesn't have the money to really enforce that law. And the website uh, for, the led, uh, for the Secretary of State's office, upon which we fought to get these contributions and expenditures posted, is very difficult to navigate. So that, so that, needs, to be, that needs to be improved. Um, we do have a gift act in New Mexico, which bans gifts over $250 to legislators, individual gifts to legislators, and cumulative gifts of $1,000 from one person to a legislator throughout the year. We passed that in 2007, and frankly, um, 
it's it's far too high. The thresholds are far too high, I believe. 250 bucks. I never got a gift that was worth 250 bucks from a lobbyist. Uh, and to think that I would get one that was worth a thousand dollars through or a, a couple of them uh, is is a real stretch. So it wasn't really, you know, as uh, great a measure as it looked. Uh, but it certainly, you know, we do have to take incremental steps, and we need to take incremental steps and to continue doing it. We need to close the revolving door uh, so that former legislators cannot immediately become lobbyists. Twenty six other states have at least a, you know, a hiatus or a modesty period between uh, when form when legislators can go and lobby. Um, and um, I think that also um, lobbyist salaries need to be revealed. Certainly their clients need to be uh, revealed um, on, on name tags so that the public can know. Not everybody's going to go to the legislative website to find out that information. Um, and we need to be sure we enforce and penalize wrongdoers um, who don't report their expenditures, who don't report their contributions, um, or who do not actually say what their expenditures are for, what issue that they are lobbying for, or what senator or house person they are spending the money on. There are too many lobbyists that fill out their report and say, I spent $12,000 for lobbying activities. So isn't it true that the reliance uh, on lobbyists by legislators is in part at least driven by the fact that they do not have salaries, that they are basically volunteers? And wouldn't, uh, wouldn't solving that issue a little bit uh, ease up on the, on the enormous pressure and power that lobbyists have. Well, when you have a citizen's legislator, particularly a citizen's legislature that is unpaid and um, doesn't have personal staff for each member, I think there's a, a real opportunity for conflict of interest and uh, for uh, the special interests and their lobbyists to fill in the blanks and to provide that expert opinion, that history, that expertise that is needed to make policy, um, and also to, um, to provide, um, to sort of set a floor and, and allow the legislators to have a kind of respectable uh, lifestyle th that befits the important positions that they have. And now, I don't know what happens in other states, but um, I think where you have a professional uh, body, uh, you, um, your lobbyists are less influential. And um, yet, I think what happens now is that in New Mexico, it's up to the public whether to uh, pass measures that would pay legislators. And right now, even though uh, the public doesn't like lobbyists and the undue influence that they have on the legislature, they don't like professional politicians either. So, you know, that's why we are where we are. Well, this has been a great eye-opener into the inner workings of uh, the legislature, and I've really enjoyed it, and I've, I've loved your stories, and I've loved your insights. Thank you so much for being here with us. Well, thanks so much for having me.